GD106, Geometry of Design, with Duncan Heather. It's vital that students understand the principles of geometry, as most design originates from two basic shapes, the circle and the square. Both shapes have a number of unique characteristics that influence their role in design. The circle has a number of component parts that are vital to its use in design composition. The component parts of a circle represent the centre, the circumference, the radii, the extended radii, the diameter, and most dangerous of all, the tangent. Of all of the circle's components, the centre plays the most important part. It naturally attracts attention. The radius, extended radius and diameter all pass through the centre, and other components lead the eye to the centre. This means that any lines running through the circle will create a visually harmonious relationship with the circle itself. An infinite number of design compositions can be generated by exploring the basic components of a specific form. By combining the component parts of a circle with each other, many different compositions can be achieved. While the radius, diameter and extended radius all pass through the centre, if we link a circle with another circle, the general rule is that the circumference of one should pass through the centre of the other. Here on the screen, we can see that a square has been linked to a circle, and this has been done by creating the corner of the square and linking that with the centre of the circle. In design terms, we talk about this being a strong bond. This can be best explained by imagining cutting out shapes out of card and trying to stick them together. It's very important that we have enough overlap between individual shapes to create a large gluing surface in order to create what we term a strong bond. Here, by using the circle center, we're able to create a, a visually harmonious relationship back to the square. If we didn't use the circle center, the square would look like it's just attached randomly into the circle and there would be no sense of geometry. Unlike the circle, the square is not found naturally in nature. A square has four defined directions of orientation, and unlike the circle, it therefore doesn't face out in all directions. Despite these differences, they have one important characteristic in common. Each can fit into the form of the other. We've already seen in our design exercise one that using the square and running diagonal lines from corner to corner identifies the square's center. And then by using your compass on that intersection, we can draw a circle that just touches the top, bottom, and the two sides of the square. The square is inherently divided by two axes which are parallel to its sides and pass through the centre. There are six specific components to a square that are important during form composition. These are the sides, the extended sides, the axes, the extended axes, the diagonal and the extended diagonal. The first most important rule of combining forms is that their component parts of each form should coincide with the component parts of the other adjoining forms. To best illustrate this, let's take a look at a courtyard garden in London. On the screen you can see the house at the bottom, but then start to visualize how the design was put together. The deck and planting is part of a rectangle as is the pond. Additional planting 
all using shared sites works because they're all tied together. This interlocking pattern is created and helps to give a sense of flow and a direction of movement. This movement comes about as a result of those interlocking areas. And you can see from the diagram how this works. Successful design usually comprises of similar forms working together to create visual order. When two or more forms are combined, attention should be given to the relationship established among the form components. In design terms, it's perhaps easier to imagine pieces of card cut out and stuck together. In order to create a strong bond, you need a certain amount of overlap. This overlap also helps to create our route of flow. In the design on the screen, you can see another London courtyard on three floors. We have a basement, a first floor with a balcony, and upper floors to the house looking down onto the garden. When you look at the design, you can see how the design is put together as a series of interlocking squares and rectangles. But also, look at the amount of overlap that is created between the individual shapes and how the sides and extended sides, the axes and the diagonals all help work together to create a series of strong bonds. The second rule of design is to avoid the creation of acute angles or sometimes called nasty corners as these can create visually weak relationships between forms and are points of visual tension. Acute angles are created as a result of tangents and embeds or borders result in muddy, barren triangles. Here on the screen I see a, a design that I see regularly at different shows around the country. In my mind it represents appalling design because the whole setup is full of nasty corners. The movement from the patio at the bottom across the lawn to the sunbathing terrace at the top allows a whole series of potential muddy triangles. Because of the route of flow, pedestrian movement will not always walk precisely where they need to walk and therefore foot traffic alone will tread on plants and eventually these plants will die back revealing just muddy triangles. In terms of paving acute angles are often structurally weak. If you can imagine trying to cut concrete paving stones with an angle grinder to create really pointy corners you'll realize how difficult it is because the paving stones will keep breaking because the angle grinders themselves are not designed to cut curves. You can see also that because of the small surface area of these pieces of stone, trying to bond them to the foundation is extremely difficult because they don't have enough area for the mortar to be able to create a strong bond. Therefore, small sections of paving are often scuffed or kicked and therefore loosened from the terrace and often lost and can create very nasty, scruffy looking edges. In addition to the weak relationship caused by the thin paving, acute angles can also create a sense of dead space because the areas are too small to be of any functional use. You can again see from the diagram on the screen that even placing pots or tubs in these very small, thin, pointy areas to both sides of the terrace would mean that you still have an area of paving behind them which serves no purpose at all. The third guideline is to establish form identity. Make sure the individual shapes contained within the composition can be recognized as distinct forms. Here on the screen we have four interlocking rectangles. Again, Think of them as pieces of cardboard stuck together and we've created a series of strong bonds because we have a sufficient gluing area to hold the card together 
the pattern creates a route of flow. You can see from the arrows that moving from bottom right to top left, there is a definite sense of movement from one shape to the next. These are created as a result of the interlocking patterns. And it's very important in design terms that those patterns are not lost when it comes to creating the garden for real. You can see from the diagram on the right that if we were to pave this whole area, we lose that interlocking pattern and our shape becomes this amorphous blob. Whereas if we were to use two different paving materials, for example, a brick and a stone paving, we could maintain the pattern on the left quite successfully. I suggest that brick edging could be used and also brick could be used for the smaller squares and then the larger areas infilled with larger paving and in that way the route of flow would be maintained and these subliminal signals not lost when you're actually walking through the space. The fourth guideline is to have one form dominate the overall composition allowing form identity and a visual po focal point. So to summarize, the designer should align shapes to create strong bonds and a strong route of flow. You must also avoid acute, nasty angles. Avoid tangents at all costs because they create visually weak relationships in both paving and planting and also dead space. Thirdly, you need to establish form identity. Make sure you don't lose that interlocking pattern when you come to build the garden properly. And finally, establish shape dominance. Don't use too many different shapes within the design and have one dominant shape that becomes the main focal point. When joining circles together, it's recommended that the circumferences of one pass through the centre of the other, thus creating a strong bond. If the circles overlap too much, or indeed too little, a weak relationship can be created. If we look at our first circle, and imagine again these as pieces of card that we're trying to cut out and stick together. Here, the overlap is very small allowing very little gluing area and therefore it can be said to be a weak bond. If you took the larger circle piece of card and flapped it around, very quickly that smaller circle would fall off. Conversely, when we looked at the second image, you can see that the circle has got so much overlap that you have lost form identity. The circle itself no longer looks like a true circle, more like a pimple. Our third example has created nasty corners and therefore because the circumferences just touch each other have created a series of tangents. Our fourth example has missed altogether and it's only come when we come to the fifth example can we see the circumference of the larger circle travels through the centre of the smaller. Overlapping circular themes have several qualities. The design is both segmented, though still with related parts. This allows the designer to create spaces with distinct functional purposes. The design also lends itself to many directions or feelings of orientation. Overlapping circles will create soft patterns, especially when a variety of circle sizes are used. The composition should have a dominant focal circle, which represents an important area of the garden, such as a lawn or dominant terrace area. And it's also important to remember, with any rules, once you understand them, those rules can be broken. 
In the example on the screen, if we see the first two circles, again, imagine these as pieces of card cut out. And we have to ask ourselves, is the overlap sufficient to create a reasonably strong bond? Because they're quite small, I'm going to suggest that this does have enough overlap, despite the fact that the circle circumference doesn't run through the center of the other. If we look at the third circle, you can see that the overlap has increased because the area of the circle and the scale of the circle has also increased. It still doesn't fulfill the rule, but I still believe that if we imagine these as pieces of card cut out, the area of overlap creates a strong enough bond to hold them together. Our fourth circle, which is our largest, again has a much larger overlap than the previous two. But it still doesn't quite tie in with our design rule of the circumference and the centre. But again, in my mind, I'm breaking the rules, but I still believe that we're creating a sense of flow and a strong bond. The fifth circle is a bit of an anomaly. It's called juxtapositioned. It's when you place a smaller circle inside a much larger circle. It doesn't fulfill any of the design rules, but it still seems to work. I use this combination in many of my designs, particularly with using rough grass and cut grass, with the smaller circle being the rough grass and the inner larger circle area being the cut lawn. The smaller circle helps to create a sense of root of flow through the lawn and it allows me to plant trees and bulbs in the grass without having to cut the, the bulbs down in the spring or indeed damage the tree with a lawnmower. The final circle does fulfill our design rule. The circumference of the larger circle goes through the centre of the smaller circle and thus demonstrates that we, in fact, do understand the rule, even though we haven't actually followed it to the letter. In our next slide, you can see a series of interlocking and overlapping circles. But also, for the first time, we've introduced concentric circles. Concentric circles are those that actually share the same center point. So here on the screen, we have two circles sharing the same compass point. Our third circle complies with the rule because the circumference of the larger circle travels through the center of the smaller circle. Our next circle has a, a very small overlap and it's barely enough to tie those two shapes together. So in this situation, we've introduced a third interlocking circle that increases the gluing space and therefore the strength of the bond between the two smaller circles. With the large, dominant, thick circle, again, the gluing area is not sufficient to create a strong bond. And in this situation, we've introduced an inner circle to help create additional gluing area and tie that back into the smaller outer circle. Finally, we've introduced a rectangle, or at least a part of a rectangle. This has the effect of tying the top shapes back down to the lower shapes. It's almost an additional linking feature. If we look and extend the rectangle, we can see that the line passes into and through the centre of the larger, thicker, dominant circle at the top. And likewise, halfway down, if we extend the line, we can see that that ties through into the centre of our smaller circle and also against the circumference of our larger first circle. You can see that without these shapes, 
the design still looks interesting, but I think something is added to the composition by introducing this rectangle in addition to the circles to make the whole composition visually more interesting. Another thing that it's important to point out is the way that you orientate your pattern. The human eye reads patterns in very different ways. And if you look at the screen, this combination of shapes is exactly the same as the slide before. But you can see that we have a, a different feel and a different relationship to each one of those three shapes on the monitor. Which one do you prefer? Do you have a preference? The chances are your preference will be the very first combination of shapes you saw, which will be the previous slide. Moving on, we can talk more about concentric circles, because these create very strong compositions due to the focal attention at the centre, where the radii and extended radii originate. Compositional variety is achieved by varying the lengths and the amounts of rotation of the radii. And I personally believe this style is best suited for inward-looking urban designs that require a strong focal point. I also believe that this pattern looks quite dated now, maybe from the 1980s, and should not really be used in any garden environment. If you're going to use this shape combination at all, I think it's more appropriate for an office or retail environment in a commercial capacity. Next we'll look at the rectangular theme, which is used in both formal and informal design. It's normally orientated parallel to the size of the house, where it reinforces the existing rectangular architecture of both house and plot. When using rectangles, you should consider the variety and size, the scale, and the amount of overlap. Interpreting a pattern that you create as a piece of art and turning it into a garden is limited only by your imagination. Fundamentally, designers only have four materials to play with. Those are paving, water, lawn, and planting. When we look at our patterns, we can allocate one of those four materials to the areas, thus turning our pattern into a garden. On the example on the screen, you can see a series of interlocking squares and rectangles. But our interpretation of these is only limited by our imagination. If we take the long, thin rectangle, this could be our path, a paving surface of maybe cobbles or white granite sets. The two squares on the sides could be water features. They could be very thin black trays of water which reflect the sky and the plants and trees above. Our line at the end of our path could be a wall made of either stone, brick, or rendered concrete block. And in that wall, there's an archway which allows movement through to a terrace beyond. That terrace is perhaps made out of white concrete paving or white limestone to give a very modern feel. Next, our large rectangle could be a water feature a pond, or even a swimming pool. And finally, the last line could become a glass block wall, maybe six foot high, encompassing our white terrace area, and overlapping our swimming pool. On top of that glass block wall, we could have a rill, or a water feature, which ran along the top, and then trickle down the sides into the swimming pool, providing a visual interest. We could take that exact same design and interpret it in a completely different way, just by changing the materials. 
instead of a modern white concrete path, we could go with a herringbone brick paved path. Instead of our black reflective water trays, we could have two cubes of box or yew. The wall at the end of our path could become an eight-foot yew hedge, again with an archway allowing access through and onto a York stone traditional terrace patio. Our swimming pool could become a formal lawn area. And finally, our glass block wall could become a low box hedge, allowing a visual view across the lawn to the planting on the other side. We've used exactly the same ground pattern, but have designed it in a totally different way, just by changing the materials that we're using. And later on, you can see that you can radically change your plans, not by changing the design, but by simply choosing the different materials. So rectangular design, like circles, a variety of different sizes should be used. And there should be a dominant larger space depicting the more important areas of the design. Scale is important, as too many short lines will make the design look fussy. The same rules of overlap that apply to circles also apply to rectangles. And in order to create a series of strong bonds, a sufficient overlap or gluing space should be allowed for each of the shapes. The rectangular theme is very appropriate for developing exterior space in close proximity to the building, as its symmetry is reflected in the architecture of the building. It's also appropriate for sites that are enclosed and restrictive because of its effective use of space. Using circles in built-up areas is dangerous simply because you're more likely to get involved with tangents. The use of rectangles and squares in rectangular gardens is far more efficient and is a better use of space. However, there is a danger that rectangular design can become monotonous and the third dimension now plays a very important role in the creation of interesting functional space. Next, we talk about curvilinear design, which is sometimes referred to as organic, biological, or freeform. In fact, it is entirely man-made, and these terms can be quite misleading. The curvilinear theme uses portions of different circles and their circumferences to create its overall form. Unlike the overlapping theme, curvilinear design relies on the circles just touching each other, so forming continuous transitions. Finally, we'll look at the diagonal theme. This is essentially the rectangular theme turned at an angle in relationship to the house. However, when lines of pure diagonal theme connect to the house, we're in danger of creating weak, acute angles or nasty corners. So therefore, modified diagonals may be more appropriate. These combine both the rectangular and the pure diagonal theme which offer a more satisfactory relationship with the building. You can see from the top diagram, this is a pure diagonal design. The design seems to bounce off the corners and creates a series of weak, nasty corners where they meet the boundaries of the, of the house and garden. In the second example, we have modified these angles and moved the design away from the boundaries in order to avoid the nasty corners. And where we have lines converging with the sides, instead of bringing them in at 45 degrees, at the end we have turned them at 90 degrees 
So we have created a design that ties both the 90 degree and the 45 degree design together. This avoids nasty corners. It also avoids dead space and also avoids the, the need to cut paving into very thin, pointy angles.